Most people don't realize the race is almost over by the time that starting light turns green. It's about consistency and preparation. The decisions we're committed to. The motivation to do the necessary maintenance. That's what keeps the engine running. Without real intention, it's easy to be left in the dust. It's discipline. Day in, day out that nobody sees. That's where the race is won. to be here. This has been a fun teaching series, if nothing else, just for the rumble, right? Before I get to teach God's Word, I think that must be a requirement. From now on, before we teach God's Word, there has to be a rumble, like a race car going down the racetrack. And, but hey, let's, let, let's talk, because as we've been working our way through this series, we've been talking like getting the tools right, the fuel right, refreshing the engine, because you don't have to be a drag car junkie, a race car fan to realize, man, that's inspiring. Because I want to live a life of power. Like, I want to live a life of precision and accuracy and focus. I want to win. Like, I want to win. But as inspiring as that image is, it actually kind of challenges to, us to ask the question, what is the win? Like, really. Like, what is the win in your life when you are fully experiencing what God has for you, like what would that look like? Because it's not completely like a race car because we don't want to get to the end first. Like you don't become a 10-year-old and say, like I just want to end life first. I mean, that's my goal in life is to be done. Like, that's not it. So what is it? Now, some of us might be tempted to buy the T-shirt that says, he who dies with the most toys wins. And some of us kind of live like we're wearing the t-shirt that says, at least I didn't do what you did. Win. Or some of us are kind of living like our shirt says, American dream. You know, I, I want to be prosperous, I want to be healthy, I want to have a bunch of friends, want to be influential, want to be successful. American dream win? Like is, is that it? Like as Americans, have we gotten it so right that we've just read exactly what God wants for us? Or could it be that our win is off a little? Mine was. I remember, um, it's been several years now, but I remember with such specificity that it feels like it was yesterday when I discovered the when in my life was wrong. And, and I'm not talking about the early years when I was living um, not aligned with God at all. I'm not talking about those years. I'm talking about a season in my life that I was dedicated to living for God. But once I took a step back and looked at what I was doing, I was actually not winning. And it was a dramatic enough experience that I quit my job. We sold our house. We actually sold everything that didn't fit in one U-Haul truck. 
and moved to Arizona because it was the only way I knew to recalibrate my life. Like I didn't know how to adjust as much as I needed to adjust without starting over. So we moved. And today I get to share what we saw. And, and the good news is you're not going to have to sell all your stuff and pack up in a U-Haul and move to Arizona to get it right. Um, but if you and I catch a glimpse of what Jesus reveals to us today, it has the real potential to change your life and um, cause you to experience power and precision and victory like you've longed for but has been eluding you. It'll change your life. And you got to stick with me because we discover it in the last four words. So here we go. If you got your Bible or your Bible app, join me in Matthew 28. So first gospel, first book of the New Testament, last chapter of the gospel. So what's really cool is we are finishing up this series of firing on all cylinders with the last words captured by Matthew that Jesus said to his disciples. So we've already had the scripture read to us. Now let's dig in and see what God would say to us this morning. So here we go, Matthew 28, verse 16. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. Now we underline the word now because it's really important to understand how this word is being used. It's being used in a way that you use it frequently. Like you've said before, um, when you were shopping, this is not a good deal. Now this one is. There's a contrast. Not good, good. Now this is the one. That's what's going on here. Now the 11 disciples, if, if you've been around the church for a while, if you've read your Bible, uh, you know that there was one of Jesus' best friends who betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver, sold him out, betrayed him, and walked away. His name was Judas. Judas. Now it's down to 11. And the 11 who are with Jesus are now going all in. And we find that now they have gone to the place, Galilee, to which Jesus directed them. There's another comparison. In the verses right before this, um, the guards who were positioned at the tomb and said, don't let anybody touch Jesus, meaning his dead body, and they saw everything that the disciples and the ladies saw when they came to the tomb, that the stone was rolled away, it was empty, Jesus was gone. And the religious leaders paid them to start telling people they stole his body. They saw the image of the empty tomb, and they sold out for money. The disciples saw the empty tomb, and they went all in. Here's the deal. From the very beginning, the resurrection of Jesus has separated people. Some sold out Jesus, walked away, said, hey, if I can get some money out of this deal, that's fine with me, because that's what life is all about. Others realized, if Jesus came back to life, he's got to be who he said he was. Because Jesus came, preached differently than anybody else did, healed people like no one else ever had. And in his teaching, he said, I'm the son of God. Like, I am God in the flesh. And as he went along, he said, hey, here's what's going to happen to me. And he predicted with great specificity of who would execute him, how they would execute him, and on what day he would rise from the dead after they executed him. And with the resurrection, he proved he was who he said he was. Maybe you've been at a place where you're like, I don't know what to do with Jesus. I just kind of think he was a good dude. There's actually no logical way to say, eh, to Jesus. It really is all or nothing. Because nothing would be, this guy claimed to be God, and he was an absolute lion heretic. Don't trust a word he says. Everything would mean, he actually raised from the dead and proved he was who he said he was. What he says is everything and truth and life. There's no place in the middle to just go, oh, gee, golly, I think he's a swell dude. No, he was either a lion heretic 
or he was the son of God from the very beginning, the resurrection of Jesus separated people. Now, just because you followed him, believed in him, didn't mean everything was easy. Check this out. Look in verse 17. This might be the most encouraging piece of our text. In verse 17, it says, when they saw him. So these are the people who laid eyes on the resurrected Jesus. These are the ones. The ladies came to the tomb. Then Peter and John came to the tomb. Then the disciples saw him in the upper room. I mean, these are the people who laid eyes on him. They saw him, and they worshiped him. They're like, boom, hitting the floor. They're like, wow, holy smokes. But some doubted. Isn't that encouraging? Because I do that. I mean, I, I believe God. Like, I believe God will provide all my needs. But sometimes I'm anxious about those needs. I believe God loves me and has a beautiful plan for my life that he works all things together for good because I'm a child of his. But sometimes I ask why. I know God is my rock and he is my protector. He loves me. His shield is about me. And yet sometimes I experience fear. And I've thought in the past, man, if I had just been there and saw the resurrected Jesus, I wouldn't be scared of nothing. I would never have a doubt. They did. To doubt means to hesitate. It's those times when you say, oh, I believe God, but then you stop short. I know that, and then you pause. It's so encouraging to know that even those who laid eyes on him hesitated. I love how Pastor Jason said it this week. To a group of hard-headed doubters, Jesus gave the most important mission in the world. They weren't perfect. They weren't perfect in their faith. They weren't perfect in their understanding. They sure weren't perfect in their obedience to Jesus. And yet he gave his best friends the most important mission in the world. Here it is, verse 19. Jesus said to his best friends, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in, an, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Now just by reading that commission, you see four actions to which Jesus called his best friends. Go, make disciples, baptizing them, teaching them. Like you see the four action words. And then he says, do it as I've commanded you. So that he's not calling them to that action. He's already done that. But because we're not Greek scholars, we don't catch the nuances that are revealed in the original language in Scripture. So since we're not scholars, we're going to cheat and we're going to color code the words because when we do, it takes on a whole lot more meaning to us. So first of all, we need to color the words, make disciples red. And we're going to color them red because this is the bullseye of the mission. Now, you might say, okay, like what, what does that really mean to make a disciple? Here's what Jesus' best friends knew. They knew that they had been following him for about the last three years. Probably a little shorter than that, but around three years. To be a follower of Jesus was something they knew themselves to be. They were disciples. So what Jesus says to his disciples who have been following him is that they were to then take the role of helping other people follow them. So as I have led you, now I want you to lead other people. So have people following you like I've had you following me. And like you, you can do it. It's re really simple. Just keep living the way I've coached you. I mean, we're, we're talking about be a life coach. Coach other people to do life like I've coached you to do life. Make disciples. That is the mission. That is the bullseye to which Jesus handed the baton to his best friends. But to understand that a little bit more, we need to uh, bring in the other words. The first word that we're going to bring into this is the word go. 
We're going to color go orange because it's a different type of word. It's actually a participle. So if you uh, love language and like all three of us in the room. But anyway, if you, if you enjoy English and grammar and all that kind of stuff, a participle modifies the verb. And this is really important. So Jesus did not say, go and also make disciples. The word go modifies making disciples. So he's telling them, go make disciples. This is the bullseye. Now I'm commissioning you to go do that. Like you have to do this on purpose. Making disciples is not something that just happens in your life. You have to go do it for it to happen. Now for some of the people, he was going to ask them to go somewhere else. Um, Most notably the apostle Paul as he joined the apostle group. And God would send him out all over the world. Like going for the apostle Paul was going all over the place. But for most of his best friends... Jesus was saying, go home. Go by staying where you live right now. Like they were going to stay in Jerusalem for a short time and for many of them for a long time. To go make disciples meant to live differently, to live with intentionally. Not go on a trip, not go be a missionary, not go become a pastor. It was live in a very different way where now you are life coaching people right where you're at. So the word go has some punch to it because it's in front of the verb. The other two participles, baptizing and teaching, follow the verb. So they describe what it looks like when you do the action that you were commissioned to do. So we're going to color them yellow. When you are making disciples, you're going to be baptizing people. Like You're going to be a part of people being baptized. What does it mean to be baptized? It means to align your life with Jesus. It means to say that I am now following Jesus. I am now submitted to Jesus. And when you are making disciples, like people are going to get started. They are going to align their lives with the Lord. It's part of the deal. And it didn't take very long for Jesus to show that that was going to happen. Jesus appeared for 40 days after his resurrection. And 10 days after that, The Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 people got baptized. Jesus said, this is what's going to happen when you make your mission to go make disciples. People will get baptized. You're going to see people begin the journey of following me with you. The second thing that's going to happen is you're going to be teaching people all the stuff I told you. Like, you're going to be teaching them not just facts and figures, You're going to be teaching them how and what it looks like to observe the way that I taught you. As you make disciples, you baptize them as you get started. You teach them along the way as they are learning the way of Jesus. That's the mission. Make disciples. To do that, you got to go. Like you have to change the purpose of your life. And when you do, my best friends, he's saying to them, people are going to get baptized, and then you're going to be able to teach them my ways. And Jesus says, this is the most important mission in the world. In verse 19, excuse me, it'd be actually verse 18, he says, all authority has been given to me. I just proved it. I have been raised from the dead. All authority has been given me. And now I commission you. So the big story is this. God has been on a mission to save his people from their sins. He sent Jesus who was born in a manger. Then lived perfectly his entire life. Having lived perfectly accomplishing what you and I could never do. He then gave his life dying on the cross in our place, taking our sins upon him, overcoming sin and death proven on Sunday morning when the tomb was left empty. And he says, I have authority. This is the mission of God. He has sent me to bring salvation to his people. Now go make disciples. And then in verse 20, 
He says, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to go with you. So this doesn't depend on you because I'm going to be with you. When Jesus ascended into heaven on the 40th day and handed the baton off to his best friends, there were 120 Christians in the world. 120 people on planet earth who believed God sent his son, he lived perfectly, died sacrificially, rose victoriously. You can be saved. 120 people in the entire world. And it wasn't easy to be a Christian in that world. You see, Christianity wasn't an authorized religion in the Roman Empire. It wasn't accepted or endorsed. And so to be Christian was to put yourself in a vulnerable place. And soon Christians were experiencing persecution. Like some by their families who said, man, if you're going to believe Jesus is alive, you're no son of mine. Others who had businesses and people stopped buying or selling to them. If you're going to be one of those Christians, I want nothing to do with you. And then there were persecutions that broke out that were specifically against Christians, such as the burning of Rome. And so all of a sudden, there was this persecution thing that was spreading, and it was hard to be Christian. Threatened, beaten, some even killed for declaring that they believed in Jesus. Nonetheless, in the first 300 years of persecution, when it was hard to be Christian, the number of believers on planet earth grew from 120 to by the most conservative of estimates, look it up, Google it, look up the article on Wikipedia, 120 to 20 million. During 300 years of persecution, the most conservative estimates say that one out of 10 people in the world came to believe within the first 300 years of persecution that Jesus was alive, that he is the savior of the world. Amazing. Jesus said, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to build my church and do a miracle. And he did. But it didn't stop in the lives of the apostles. It didn't stop in the first century. It didn't stop in the first 300 years. It didn't stop in the first millennia. He keeps doing this work. And so in the very last four words of this mission, we find out, that it wasn't just Jesus' best friends. It wasn't just this little blip on the radar screen of history. It wasn't just the super Christians and missionaries and vocational Christian leaders today. It's for all of us. Jesus said, this is to the end of the age. This is for us. This this is Jesus' commission of everyone who declares, I'm a follower of Jesus. This is our mission. As David Platt has said, to be a disciple is to make disciples. If you are to say that I'm a follower of Jesus, to understand accurately what you're saying, you are also saying, I'm helping other people follow Jesus. I've experienced life through Jesus, and I'm coaching other people to do the same. This is why in the year 2005, when I was a pastor of a growing church, I quit my job. We sold everything, put it in a U-Haul truck, everything that would fit, got rid of everything else, and moved. Because I came to realize that even though I was serving God, I was not making disciples. You, you, you know the truth of it? If in 2005 you had come to me and you'd said, hey, Michael, I read some verses in the Bible about making disciples. Would you please disciple me? I wouldn't have had a clue what to do with you. And that's kind of sick. Because 
to be a disciple is to make disciples. I realized that in our church, people were showing up. Um, like they came to attend a service, but like they really weren't consistently better following Jesus. And like there wasn't a clear place to start. There wasn't a clear path to take. There wasn't a way to team up with other people who wanted to be on the same journey to take it together because you need other people on the journey with you. I was a pastor, but I was not effectively making disciples even though our church was growing. So we packed up and left it all to try to figure out what does this commission mean anyway? What does it mean to go make disciples and baptize and teach? What does that even look like? It's why today, it took us a while, it's why today when someone says to you, how do I get started? It's really easy at Cornerstone. We would say, step one. Like, here's where you start. If someone were to say, hey, what's Cornerstone all about? It's real simple. Helping people follow Jesus. It's why at Cornerstone you hear us say a lot, get in a group. Like, we're obsessed with you being in a group, having some people with you because you can't take this journey alone effectively. You're going to stumble and fall and need somebody to pick you up. Like getting a group, getting a verge, some people who know everything so they can go with you in this. This is, this is our mission. But the truth of it is, um, for those of us here today who are not making disciples, it's not that we didn't know Jesus commissioned us. Let's just be really straight. The reason we're not discipling people is because of the very thing I experienced 13 years ago. If someone were to ask us, would you please disciple me? We would have no idea what to do. But we're wrong. You actually know what you don't know you know about making disciples. And to illustrate it in the most simplest of ways, discipling someone to follow Jesus is as easy as teaching a little kid to swing a wiffle ball bat. You and I both know if you want to teach a kid to hit a wiffle ball, the most important thing for you to do is show them. It is not very effective to sit over on the side and preach a sermon to them about swinging a bat. The good news is you don't have to be a major league baseball player or have a master's degree in kinesiology to teach a kid to hit a wiffle ball. Actually, the best way to teach a kid how to hit a wiffle ball is to bring your arms around his or her arms, your hands on his or her hands, and give them a feel of it. And then you have a friend or a tee hold the ball or pitch the ball, and you hit it. And they get a feel of what it means to break their wrist. They get a feel of what it means to hold their bat back and swing. It's as easy as teaching a kid to hit a wiffle ball. Discipling someone else is. You see, you have gotten paralyzed by thinking it's stand over here and describe in technical language the mechanics, kinesiology, that it takes to hit a ball effectively. You have stood over here thinking, I'm not a major league baseball player. I have no right teaching a class on bat swinging. Neither of which is helpful. What your kid longs for is this. This, this is what it means to disciple someone. If you have taken one or two steps in your following of Jesus, you can actually say to another person, hey, let me show you what I've learned. You know you're not major league. 
they know it too, just to be straight. But you know you're not major league, but, but like you can teach the basics. You can show them, like you can say to them, hey, just, I, I, I don't know, just come over to my house. Come over to my place. Come hang out with me. And they can actually watch what it looks like to follow Jesus. And then when you have one of those moments that you weren't following Jesus, like you were really sharp or short or terse or mean or lost your temper, that's when you stop and say, uh, not that part. And they're like, oh, cool. So I, I don't have to get it perfect when I'm starting. You're like, uh-uh, I ain't got it perfect yet. Okay, it's really encouraging to them. Just, just show them what you know. Just let them watch you. Invite them over. Let them hang out with you. Just, just show them what it feels like to swing the bat. And then you're going to tell them what you know to this point. Like, you don't know all the answers to the questions. But some of you have thought, oh, i got to be major league. i got to stand back here until I get it all figured out. No, 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 no. Like, you understand, when she lets go of the ball, swing. Put your left hand under your right hand unless you're left-handed. And then you put your right hand under your left hand. You swing this way. Like, here's, here's how you do it. I don't know much, but here's, the, here's what I know. And you get to share what you know about following Jesus. And your friend's like, oh. Okay, I think I could do that. And I can't do all the other stuff, but like I, I think I could do that. Like you know what you don't know, you know about helping somebody follow Jesus. It's not kinesiology in Major League Baseball. It's a wiffle ball. So if we were to make it really simple, if we were to recognize today, like we have been handed down all the way from the best friends through the millennia, and now have the greatest mission in the world to help other people follow Jesus like we follow Jesus, gets really simple. It's kind of like show and tell. So I'm going to challenge you today, and then again tomorrow morning and like every morning, to make two requests of God. When you wake up, I want you to ask the Lord to give you an opportunity to show someone today, this day, what it looks like to follow Jesus. Just one simple little thing. Simple little thing. God, just let, let me show somebody something. I got, I got this one thing I figured out. You know, I, I learned how to pray. I, le- I, learned, I learned how to, to read my Bible. I learned what it looked like to trust you when I don't know how the finances are going to work. Like, I know one thing. I don't know everything, but I know one thing. God, just let me show somebody one thing today. And then two, the tell part. When you wake up, ask the Lord, God, let me have um, like just one today, like just one God conversation. It doesn't have to be long, but just one little moment where I get to tell somebody something about you. Like, I don't know everything about you. But here's what I learned last week. Here's what I learned yesterday. God, give me an opportunity to tell somebody what I do know. And when you show and tell, You're making disciples. And you didn't even know it. You're on a mission. You didn't even know it. But if you don't go and do that intentionally, you'll get to a place where I was not that long ago. Of it looking like to everybody else, oh yeah, you live for God. And you realize you have the wrong win. You have the wrong t-shirt on. God is inviting you into the most important mission in the world. And as you begin to see little followers coming behind you, you will be proud and energized because you'll know the Lord is with you in what he's doing in them. Today is part of our worship service. We're going to take communion together. And today I want you to realize that when you hold that little piece of bread in your hands, when you hold that little bit of juice in your hands, you are holding the elements that remind us of the mission. This is the mission we're on. This is what God has called us to. We know the win. And we know that when we stand in front of Jesus one day, one of the things he will ask us is, Who'd you bring with you? Because that's part of following Jesus. Let me pray for us.
Father, we, we are so thankful on a gorgeous fall day to be able to gather in worship of you. We are so thankful as Americans to have an extraordinary freedom to gather publicly with no fear in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And God, we are thankful that you have not only asked us to follow you, but you've told us what it looks like. You showed us what it looks like to live the blessed, anointed, best way of life. So God, thank you for the privilege, the high and holy privilege of inviting others to come along with us. And God, as we uh, gather in your name, may you show us again the beauty of the gospel, the beauty of our Savior, your mission to bring salvation to your people and how we get to be a part of it. Even inviting others to be a part of it. God, may you renew in us hope. Some of us have have lost the hope, ashamed of our doubting. And yet you've shown us even people who saw you post-resurrection hesitated at times. God, thank you for the opportunity to trust you and to participate in the greatest mission in the world. Draw us to yourself as we willingly come to worship you this day. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.